In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, exalted is he who took his servant by night from Al-Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, whose surroundings we have blessed to show him of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing, the seeing. God Almighty has spoken the truth. His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani, His Excellency Moroccan Prime Minister Mr. Abdel Ilah bin Kiran, His Excellency the Secretary General of the Arab League Mr. Nabil Al Arabi, His Excellency the Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Ikmal al Din Ihsan Oglo, Mr. Robert Seri, representative of the United Nations. Firstly, I would like to extend my sincerest thanks and appreciation to His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani for Qatar's hosting of this significant conference in Doha, where we signed a declaration some days ago to accelerate the implementation of the Palestinian National Reconciliation Pact, which we already signed in Cairo and to put an end to the outstanding issues. I also would like to thank the Secretary General of the Arab League and its Secretariat General and personnel and all those who contributed to organizing this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Conference for the Defense of Jerusalem is being held today amid a very delicate and exceptional phase concerning the capital of Palestine and its beating heart and the challenges and perils it's encountering which cannot be from here on overlooked and disregarded. Giving adequate answers to these challenges is a great responsibility that prompts all those concerned about Jerusalem to adopt policies and provide the necessary means to ensure the successful maintenance of its Arab Islamic and Christian character. As it's the Prophet's ascendance to heaven, the first Qibla, the second mosque, and the third noble sanctuary. It is the city of Al Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock Mosque, and it is the city of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and Via Dolorosa, and the city which must be a symbol of peace. Within this scope, we must focus on reading what's general and key regarding the Israeli plans jeopardizing the city. Since this will enable us to draw out certain conclusions that would warrant the improvement of our performance to meet these challenges. In reviewing the events with Jerusalem, has been witnessing during the past few years. Up till today, by the occupation practices, we can draw but one conclusion. The Israeli occupation authorities are unprecedentedly speeding up using the ugliest and most dangerous means, the implementation of plans they consider as the final battle of their war, which aims to obliterate and efface the Arab, Islamic and the Christian character of East Jerusalem in a pursuit to Judea's and perpetuate it as a capital of the occupying state. Contrary to more than 15 UN Security Council resolutions which call on Israel to retract its procedures and consider them void. However, we must continue to address this international forum and I am in favor with His Highness the Emir's suggestion to bring the question of Jerusalem before the UN Security Council repeatedly until the world has answered our demands. Ladies and gentlemen, the occupation authorities attempt to achieve its ultimate goal through these plans in Jerusalem are being implemented on three correlative, interrelated and synchronous axes. The first axis through which the occupation authority 
alters the finest details of Jerusalem's landscape and structure, believing that by doing so, they can efface the world's memory and awareness of the fact that the very mentioning of Jerusalem's name can instantly evoke the image of the glittering golden dome of the noble rock and the profound, long-established and splendid imagery of the fraternity of the minarets of mosques and domes of churches standing alongside one another amidst the shadows of the walls of a city that has witnessed history, memories and events which they mistakenly believe they can alter and replace by introducing a different narrative that serves illusory myths and arrogant force. They also think that by using brute force in this context, Jerusalem stands witness to an unprecedented acceleration of settlement attacks as work is being done day and night to make up artificial details in the Jerusalem scene, details which are antithetical to Jerusalem's Arab architectural features and cultural and civilization roots which had established the identity of the city of Jerusalem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Since the removal of the Magharba quarter inside the old city of Jerusalem by the occupation forces following the 1967 war, they continue to demolish homes which carry historical value such as Karmel Mufti and others, and build settlements in several locations on lands expropriated from residents of the holy city. And despite all the enormous means and resources which the occupation authorities put at the disposal of extremists who carry out continued excavations that threaten the collapse of Al-Aqsa Mosque, in order to extract evidence and proofs that would support the Israeli version of Judaism. They miserably failed. However, that did not stop them from racing against time to do whatever is possible to add a Jewish character to the city, starting with the construction of synagogues to block the view of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the designing of scale models of the so-called temple in order to build it on the ruins of Al-Aqsa Mosque and establishing the so-called biblical gardens at the coast of the Palestinian lands and homes. In the same context, Jerusalem is being surrounded by the apartheid wall and a band of settlements to isolate the city from its surroundings in the West Bank and to break off the connection between the northern and southern regions of the West Bank. The second axis is the completion of the ethnic cleansing plan. The occupation started since the earliest days after the 1967 war with conducting a plan aiming to drive Palestinian citizens out of their own city by overstraining Jerusalemites with a volley of multiple exorbitant taxes connected to penal procedures so as to force merchants, business owners, general residents to close down their business and leave the city. The occupation authorities also lead a policy of refusal to grant home construction permits while demolishing homes which they consider to have been built without their approval. These plans culminated with the policy of revoking Jerusalemites' residency permits and depriving them of residence in their homeland. The situation took another serious inflammatory turn during the past months when the Israeli authorities arrested Jerusalemite MPs then issued and enforced orders to deport them from their city and away from their families. And furthermore, the occupation forces encouraged settlers to seize Arab homes and force their dwellers to leave. This series of actions carried out by the occupation forces 
is ethnic cleansing in the fullest sense of the word against Palestinian citizens to make them at best a minority in their own city, holding only the status of residents while blustering Jewish presence by building more settlements. The third access through which the occupation forces impoverish the holy city, destroy its infrastructure and undermine its economic resources, although it has always been throughout history a home for prosperity and a major economic, tourist, medical and educational activity center as well as a cultural, intellectual and artistic hub in Palestine. To that end, the occupation authorities closed down several Palestinian institutions and premises, such as the Orient House and the Chamber of Commerce, which was established in the 1930s, and that is before the 1948 Nakba and establishment of the State of Israel. They also refused to grant construction permits to build hospitals, universities, schools, hotels, homes, and commercial centers. And they have enacted legislations and taken procedures to control the movement of international tourists to keep them away from Palestinian-owned hotels in the city. The most atrocious measure, in addition to that taken to encircle Jerusalem with a collar of settlements in order to separate it from the remainder of the West Bank, is the setting up of permanent barriers by the occupation forces since the 1970s, by reason of which Palestinians are banned from entering Jerusalem, whether it is for purposes of prayer, work, medical treatment, study, shopping, or visiting their relatives and families, unless with virtually impossible to obtain permits. Yes, our people in Gaza and the West Bank are not allowed to visit Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher to perform prayers and religious observances. Where is the professed freedom of worship, which is a fundamental human right guaranteed by all international conventions? Born and raised in Palestine, ladies and gentlemen, is a generation who is not able to visit their sacred city, which is only a few minutes or at most a 30-minute drive away from their city, village, or camp. This measure has resulted in a state analogous to the cessation of blood flow from veins to the heart. Jerusalem has, throughout its history, received tens of thousands of residents of other Palestinian cities every day who flocked to its holy sites, markets, schools, hospitals, factories and workshops. The occupation aims to prevent Jerusalem from playing its historical and religious role and seeks to wipe out its distinguished character as a global and leading civilized center that never ceases to contribute to and enrich human civilization, trying to change it into old and faltering neighborhoods, deserted mosques and church, and empty markets and streets. It is attempting to take the jewel of Palestine and its cities centuries back. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the factual witnesses of the City of Prophets, and these are the challenges facing both Arab, Muslim, and Christian nations worldwide. And if we agree on defining the goals and plans of the occupation, it should be easy to determine the means of confrontation. One of our key conclusions, which amounts to the level of the challenge, 
is by stressing that what's required is to support the resilience and endurance of Jerusalemites, guardians of the holy city, who, despite the dark image caused by the enormity and atrocity of the occupation assault, remain a gleam of hope and a guarantee of success and resilience. For they are the people of Jerusalem, the ember holders inside and in the environs of Jerusalem. And they are the people of the land of resurrection and in gathering. Thus said the Prophet. Regardless of the attempts and plans, Jerusalem will remain Arab at heart and mind, spirit and language, and the Jerusalemites will, side by side with their entire nation, challenge these impossible situations and keep living in their city, building and protecting Al-Aqsa and the city's mosques and churches. When Israel threatened to revoke the identity cards of non-resident Jerusalemites, thousands of them hurriedly returned to the city and some big families lived in small rooms to block the occupation plans. Here, I also would like to note that there is a number of detailed studies and projects that have been carried out in different sectors over the past decades on what must be done to rescue Jerusalem. There are approved Palestinian mechanisms and professional staff to whose capacity, competence and integrity all international and financial organizations testify and who are capable of implementing any proposed project. I would like also to indicate that there have been decisions made during the Arab summits the most recent of which is the second third summit on supporting Jerusalem but these were not implemented. We have agreed with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which approved the plan we prepared for Jerusalem, that we will work together so as each and every able Arab and Islamic state supports one of the vital sectors for our people in Jerusalem, such as health, education, housing, infrastructure, culture, religious sites, trade, economy, and others. Yesterday, during my meeting with the Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Dr. Ikmal al-Din Hassan Oglo, we agreed on the plan and its implementation mechanisms. Dr. Ihsan Oglo will personally follow up the implementation of this plan which will hopefully serve as concrete actions to further our people's steadfastness in the holy city of Jerusalem. In this context, I would like to thank the Islamic Bank for the projects it's offering now to support our people in the city. On this occasion, I would like to express my extreme appreciation for the Jerusalem document, which was announced by the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar, Days ago, during the closing session of the Conference on Jerusalem, which was held in Cairo, since the document introduces a clear vision and proposes plans and activities. In this context, I note the report of the European Union Councils on Jerusalem. There are several decisions and projects which we hope to put into concrete action and implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, the core of any work we carry out is anchored in the perception and establishment of Jerusalem as a central element to the Palestinian cause. Hence our adherence to our principles stand, not to resume negotiations as long as the occupation authorities do not respect their obligations to hold settlement construction, particularly in Jerusalem. From this standpoint, we are required to work on a number of approaches. The first approach, the question of Jerusalem, must be the central, foremost and core topic in the political and economic relationships between the Arab and Islamic states and the other states of the world. 
We are all required to put together a unified action plan with the different Christian churches concerned with keeping the churches as houses of worship, not touristic sites, particularly because the Holy Land is a pilgrimage destination for tens of thousands of Christian believers annually. Accordingly, and from this platform, we assert that the so-called Jerusalem Annexation Law, which was enacted by Israel on the 27th of June 1967, is void, void, void. We also assert that East Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Palestine. The second approach, seeking to enhance the infrastructure of the Jerusalem community through adopting projects dedicated to support institutions and other projects in the Holy City. We can here expand the scope of involvement in order to encompass non-governmental organizations, not only governmental support, in addition to Arab and Islamic governments. There are broad opportunities where twin relationships and partnerships can be established between similar organizations in various educational, learning, economic, cultural and social sectors. There are also extensive opportunities to introduce a qualitative change through a series of small projects engaging the largest number possible of Arab Muslim and Christian citizens in the required effort. In this respect, the vital role that businessmen and the private sector in Arab countries can play is essentially relevant. The third approach has to do with establishing a permanent line of communication with the people of Jerusalem to break the siege imposed on the city and its people. And here I would like to note the leading role of our brothers in the 1948 territories who on a regular basis organize visits where thousands of them flock to the holy city which is besieged by settlements, the apartheid wall and the occupation barriers thereby bringing its most to life, helping its markets thrive, and making its resilient people feel that they are not alone. Therefore, it is necessary to encourage those who are able, particularly our brothers from the Arab and Islamic countries, in addition to our Arab Muslim and Christian brothers in Europe and America, to visit Jerusalem. This move will have a political, moral, economic, and humanitarian impact. Jerusalem is of importance to us all, and no one can keep us from having access to it. The flow of crowds to Jerusalem and making its streets and holy sites busy will further its people's resilience and will contribute to safeguarding and entrenching the city's identity, history and heritage under the threat of being uprooted, under the threat of being uprooted. This will also remind the occupiers that the question of Jerusalem is the cause of every Arab, Muslim and Christian. I here reiterate that visiting prisoners is a form of support for them and it does not mean or introduce in any way normalization with the jailer. And we must keep in mind the saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, do not set out on a journey except for three mosques, i.e. Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the Mosque of Al-Aqsa and my mosque. Al-Aqsa Mosque was not then under the Islamic rule, but was under the Roman rule, and the foregoing saying is applicable for all circumstances, situations, and times. When asked about Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Prophet, peace and prayers be upon him, 
orders Muslims to visit it and pray in it before it became under Islamic rule. And he said that those who are unable to visit it should send oil to it. They should send oil to it. Oil. Whether it's olive oil or petroleum, any kind of oil. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had known that a type of oil will be introduced several centuries later. Therefore, it has to be used to light up Jerusalem's lanterns, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a form of material support to strengthen the resilience of Jerusalem and its people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, traveled by night to the farthest mosque in Jerusalem during the night journey and the ascension, Isra and Maraj, where he led other prophets in prayer in Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was not back then under the Islamic rule, but it was under the Roman rule. He did not ask for permission, a visa or an authorization from the Romans to lead the prophets in prayer in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Prior to that time, prior to that time, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had dwelled in Mecca for long years, praying in Al Kaaba, while it contained tens of idols. This wasn't an acknowledgement of idolatry by him, but rather an affirmation of his legitimate right in Al Masjid al Haram. And when he wanted to visit Al Masjid al Haram after the Hijra, he was forced to obtain the approval of the Quraysh disbelievers who were in control of Mecca following the Treaty of Hudaybiya. No one would dare say that the Prophet, peace be upon him, normalized relations with them, because we always hear the term normalized. Therefore, the visit of a prisoner, as we said, is not normalization with the jailer, but it is a form of support, backing and assistance to them and to make them feel that they are not alone, but that all Arabs, Muslims, Christians and the free people of the world are supportive to them. Moreover, did any Muslim jurist outlaw the visit to Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa when they were under crusader rule? We were ruled by crusaders for 200 years. Nevertheless, visitors of Jerusalem came to Mecca and Medina, then to Jerusalem where they prayed and sometimes resided and lived there. No one at that time outlawed such visits. Did Muslims stop visiting Jerusalem during the British mandate when the British High Commissioner, Herbert Samuel, was residing in Jerusalem on the top of Jabal al-Mukabbir that towers over Al-Aqsa Mosque, supervising and administering the holy city. Nevertheless, people kept visiting Jerusalem. Therefore, we confirm that visiting a prisoner does not mean normalization with the jailer. Your Highness, Mr. Secretary General, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the message of our people in Jerusalem to you can be summed up in the following. We, the people of Jerusalem, the Holy Land, and the people of determination, do realize the magnitude of historical responsibility entrusted within us, and we are honored to fulfill the responsibility entrusted to us, and we are graced to stand in the midst of the battle and on the front line of defending Jerusalem, since Jerusalem is our identity and it is the beginning and the end. It's the key to peace, the centermost of our Palestinian cities, the beating heart of our nation and the jewel of the Palestinian, Arab, Muslim and Christian crowns, the historical and eternal capital of our state, the independent state of Palestine. Our pledge shall remain firm, always for the sake of God the Almighty, then for our brothers, the Arab Muslims and Christians, and we hereby confirm to you that we will remain steadfast here, deeply rooted here, 
We have always been here and always will, defending our beloved Jerusalem. And the day of our freedom and independence is inevitable. God willing, we will remain here resilient and steadfast. Thank you.